Hi everyone, just a quick note to say that this video is from the perception of a UK based reviewer for reasons that become clear later on. Okay, on with the review. I guess most people want to know one thing, should I buy this scanner? I can't answer this one because this product is unusual. If you ask, is it a good scanner? Does it have lots of facilities and does it connect to a computer? The answer is an absolutely yes, but I'm finding it very difficult to recommend it to anyone who watches this video. I'll explain. For somebody with a few months of scanner ownership under their belt, and I'm talking about real scanners, not portable radios with wideband receivers, then the transition to this product can be made, but that transition is far from painless. If you're a newcomer to scanning, then this is absolutely not the product to buy. The reason is simply that it does so much, but needs the user to really understand the RF world. As with most products nowadays, the instructions are terrible because they have to assume the level of skill and the knowledge you already have. It's not the fault of the manufacturers. The best they can do is produce a document that explains what the controls are, what their function is, and how to access them. All the complex devices we now use, if they're designed well, don't need a manual. The days of reading the manual before touching the product are long gone. Manuals are now the printed version of a help screen on a computer. If you get stuck, the manual can sometimes help, but in the main, you're on your own. If you're a new owner of this radio and switch it on and fiddle even with the right kind of head on your shoulders, you'll get depressed very quickly. The scanner covers from the CB band up to the microwave bands, and realistically, even if you can operate it, luck is going to not produce much in the way of results. As it arrives, the settings start a search quite quickly, usually before you've discovered how to stop the search, and certainly before you work out how to store it. So while you could find something by luck, you're searching so many bands that here in the UK are empty. My opinion is that unless you understand at the very least where in the band your interest is and can start to look in the right places, a newcomer will find very little and get fed up very quickly. The menu system has a few quirks. Like most products nowadays, the menus go down in layers. You have a pyramid with menu at the very top. Then you start to dip into each heading, going down in the pyramid. The trouble is some of these layers have very similar names and menu and main menu often appear to be the same. So you spend time looking for features that are in totally different menus. It's very confusing. As an example, searching can be done by spectrum or service or by a frequency limited search. As an example of the menu confusion, press the menu button. The menu says main menu. Go down to search and select it. Then go down to spectrum sweep. The top item is main menu, which takes you back to the main menu, which has a real button on the front panel anyway. Go down to search menu and you go back to the main menu too. The third option starts the spectrum sweep going through all the bands. 50% of these menu items are pointless. The final item in the menu is labeled public safety. Don't bother pushing this because it accesses the US bands where these transmissions are normally found. It looks in bands we have no need to even listen to here in the UK. In the main menu, the other search function is service search. And again, this points the scanner to the US band plan. And while aircraft are international, as are most of the marine channels, Railroad, public safety and even the amateur allocations are of no use at all to us in the UK. 146, 220, 420, 440 and 900 meg bands waste so much scanning time and the chances of stopping on anything useful are nil. So the only real search facility for weaker signals in the UK is the limit search where you enter a low and a high frequency and it searches between them. Menu takes you past search and to some other parameters. Delay point 1S is a strange one. This allows you to set the number of tenth seconds a unit waits before moving on. So 50 is five seconds. Obvious? No. A nice feature is called lockouts. Here you can see those frequencies that you've pressed the skip button on, on those annoying data signals and interference, and you can unskip them if you want to. It's a nice feature. Some features are accessed by very odd methods. I mentioned the limit search. You'll not be able to find the menu to allow you to set these limits. 
what you must do is from the top menu go down to search select it and then go down to limit search and select that immediately it starts scanning everywhere pressing the menu button while it's searching brings up more options who'd have guessed that one here it allows you to select what it will actually stop on uh, p25 x2 dmr and nxdn on my particular unit the next menu item is low followed by high if you select one you're presented with four main digit entry plus the decimal points so 0165.0125 works 165.0125 doesn't you can enter it with select and rotate the dial or enter it on the keypad but the cursor must be in the right position if you then save the changes the search recommences with the newly entered data all the experienced scanner users will be nodding your heads all this making some kind of sense after all it's just finding the right menus and entering the right data which you already know the new scanner user with deep pockets who bought this radio because they were told it was the best totally clueless do they know to search between 165 and 170 or maybe it's 164 in many busy areas of the country do they know about all those nasty data signals that wreck a search when your search stops on a channel you need to press menu then go down to save where the frequency gets added to the list and at this point you don't get the option to name it as the search recommences when you select save from the list and press select this is a bad feature mobile users have to read the display turn a knob press buttons to store something new surely a one button press to store would have made so much sense it's also worth noting that in the search settings menu you don't want to select dmr or one of the other digital modes because then your search will not stop on analog signals leaving these unchecked means it will stop on them if it finds them that's a bit confusing don't forget we're just talking about making something come out of the speakers on an empty out of the box radio this is a tricky beast to master experienced users get excited when they discover pressing the function button labeled fn then a keypad number is a shortcut um, and that's very handy but new users are left a bit stranded moving away from searching to just entering a new frequency first quirk is the terminology you're entering an object whistler's term for a frequency menu then to program menu then down to add conventional frequency let's add in a repeater so you type in 0145.625 and press select this sticks my local VHF repeater into the radio go down to alpha tag a very critical term and select that this means the name in the display I changed it letter at a time with rotate and select to GB3NB then hit select up to save the changes and the frequency and name are in the memory main menu then down to browse objects gives access to the things you've saved frequencies you saved from the search are identified as stored search and we'll show the CTCSS turn two if one was present one push of the menu and then selecting alpha tag allows you to rename it you can then also use the scan list function to allocate that channel to a scan list following me hard work but it gradually makes more sense if you're a beginner then you probably got lost ages ago so let me say it again if you have no knowledge of radio in general this scanner is a jump too far don't worry it doesn't mean you're thick it just means that what's called underpinning knowledge is required to work this scanner properly moving on to scanning since scanners came on the market the sheer quantity of frequencies we need to collect means that we'd spend ages grouping them perhaps civil aircraft would be put in one bank and military aircraft in another then marine band in another and so on many of these transmissions are very short and if you're scanning a hundred it could take quite a few seconds to do the lot so you miss them especially aircraft as their transmissions are usually very short turning off some of the scan banks reduces the number being scanned increasing the chances of a hit this incidentally is why buying a cheap handheld radio is terrible for scanning they scan too slowly especially when the memories are pretty full a real scanner does it much quicker the Whistler TRX2 has 200 scan lists each one can be named and enabled or not as you need them 
The neat thing is that a frequency can be in more than one list, so your favourites can be monitored more easily. When I'm out and about, I have one scan list that has all the local stuff in it, so Beckles Airport, pretty close to me and always busy with parachutists, is in the local scan list, along with some marine and business channels. Beckles is also in my airfield scan list, of course. It's rather handy. Lots of the features relate to the US and Canadian band planning scheme. So over there, these radios have loads more features. Here they just don't work like that. Just sidetracking for a moment, turning the radio on means a wait of nearly 30 seconds while it loads in and verifies the data contained on the SD card, hidden under the front detachable panel. My biggest complaint is that the scanner is very sensitive to supply voltage. If you've one of those vehicles popular now that switch off the engine at traffic lights to save the planet, or if you're in a queue, then you're going to hate this because the start-up time is a killer. The voltage dip when the starter motor engages is enough to restart the radio. This is bad. Every time the engine starts up, the radio turns completely off and you have to press the power button twice to power back up with the 30 second delay. The internal power backup is also not really very good. It doesn't keep the clock accurate if you don't use the vehicle for a day or two. The battery runs flat, the clock resets. I don't bother setting it now because I have to do it far too often. Daft feature really. If they just put a little bit more life into the backup it would be great. So great for home use, not really quite so good as a mobile is my opinion on how this radio seems to work. If you connect the radio to a computer with the programming software, you need to keep a few things in mind. You are not programming the radio. You're simply accessing the storage card. The programming software does not enable you to control the radio as you can with a software defined radio, for example. You can edit, add and delete information and do loads of things, but it's just modifying the card. Make sure you back it up. You can, if you're lucky, use the uh, supplied USB cable to do this. But when you do it, the radio powers down to give access to the card. Does it work? Well, to be honest, no, not very well. Driver issues again. Uh, my Windows 8 machine doesn't recognise this driver, and it's highlighted in the device manager. And trying to install the driver from the supplied C uh, SD card or via the website fails every time. It tells me the driver isn't tested. Windows XP and Vista on my ancient programming computers works fine. It's not a big deal because you can just pop the card out and stick it in the computer and the software is happy to communicate that way. So while the USB cable failure is annoying, it's not terminal. Maybe I'll get around to sorting it. I doubt it really. The programming software I rather like. It works in a pretty handy way so you can create and edit conventional frequencies all the trunk stuff uh, the experts understand and then look after and manage the important scan lists. The best thing is it can import data from outside. So if you find lists on the net, you can copy them to the clipboard and then enter the clipboard data into the software. Every source of information on the net is presented differently and when you try to paste it in, the software needs you to tell it which columns are the essential data. If your first column is the frequency, this usually gets picked up automatically. But if for some odd reason it's in column three, you simply click on column three and set it to frequency. The important text info, like our approach for the airband, gets called an alpha tag. This at first is confusing. Why not just call the column with Mildenhall in it Mildenhall? Uh, well, you could if you want, but it's probably better to create a scan list title called Mildenhall and then all its frequencies just have tower, approach, radar, or whatever works pretty well for you. The biggest hassle is simply organizing the data. I've discovered that sticking it into a spreadsheet, moving the columns about, and then grabbing that data to use in the radio works best. But making a consistent system that works for you is best after all. I keep a master list anyway, so formatting that to be the same in terms of the data on the columns works for me. You might do it differently, but being able to paste loads of data for maybe hundreds of objects at one time certainly speeds things up. There are plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to do this. But in most cases, a Google search produces tables on the screen and you can simply drag and select what you want and enter it into the radio software. Identify which column is which and it's done. Save it to the SD card, pop it in the radio and then when you press the scan list menu, all 200 full or empty things appear 
and you can enable or disable them from the radio. Or you can do it in the software, which to be frank is quicker and easier. This is also how you make sure each frequency appears in the right scan list. The right hand column is where you select none, all or anything in between. Now you've heard all this, you'll know if it's a possibility or not. As for the radio itself, the head can be detached and remote mounted using the cable that's supplied in the box and it's pretty sensitive, certainly equal to the other radios I have and it's not so far been annoyed by the very strong local data signals near me that wreck some of the cheaper radios I have. Is it suitable for beginner? I have to say no. It needs too much knowledge to get going. Even the manual has to make the assumption you already know whereabouts in the frequency spectrum things actually are and that scanning it all just won't work. For an experienced scanner user, the learning curve at the start is very steep. You need to forget many of your old rules, learn new ones and persevere with a slightly weird menu system that doesn't make your position on the pyramid hierarchy obvious. Too many times you think you're at the top, but you're not. The extras, like recording capability and the trunking features, are for me things for next month. At first I did consider sending it back, something I've never done before, and an insult to me really. A product I can't work out of the box, hmm. I stuck with it and eventually it clicked, and now I like it a lot. I should point out I intended to use it as a base station scanner, but at the moment it's living in my van, which is a bit unusual for me. A few comments about installation in vehicles. The radio comes with two thick single-sided sticky back pads. These fit between the mounting bracket and the radio and then large thumb wheels allow a fair range of up and down tilt. The bracket is not symmetrical and allows you to fit the radio forwards or backwards in relation to the screw mounting slots. In my case it was handy to get the right depth before the connections foul the rear. The DC cable has an inline fuse and a right angle connector. So at the back I've got just the BNC connector and the DC input. Audio through the internal speakers is actually fine, even with my van's higher noise levels. OK, conclusion time. This is a real enthusiast product. It is not designed for beginners and does need thought from the operator. It's compact, it's well designed and pretty well made, and I don't regret buying it. If I was designing an operating system, maybe I'd have made the menu system a bit easier to navigate, but with so many features to fit in, I'd probably have made a worse job. I do wish that the facilities that only work in the US or Canada were missing when you switch to the UK setup, because they're pointless and they add to the confusion. The idea of sticking in a zip code and getting all the frequencies for your area is great, but it's just annoying for people who live outside of North America. Hope this helped. See you soon.